so what what was um, so plants actually have telomerase, um, as as you might expect. Um, but what was referred to in the film was searching through um, natural compounds to find something which would turn telomerase on in human cells. So that's what they were trying to do. They weren't trying to find telomerase in a herb, but to find some naturally occurring um, compound which had the properties of being able to switch telomerase on in our cells. Look, you're touching on probably one of the most major issues of my career. I mean, I don't make anything but science films. Um, mind you, if I run out of work, maybe I'll do whatever. But, um, but you know, I've made 40 plus hours now of science films, and that's all I want to do. Um, I, I have a passion for communicating science. I think it's so brilliant, you know. Um, I call them the epics of our times, you know. Thank you. <laughs> the epics of our times, because... Um, if you look at the big fables, the great stories, the, the great dramas, the great challenges of our time right now, more than any time, I think, really, we've got science out there doing extraordinary things. I mean, every day, I have a thousand Google alerts, you know, and it comes up and every day I'm going, ah, I want to make a film about that one and that one and that one. And I have to go one every two years or something, you know. Um, so regarding the funding, I, I would love to see, um, I think what's really needed is, is seed funding. Um, uh, what usually happens is I do those first couple of years on my own and I pay for it myself and luckily my husband has a decent job. Um, but, you know, it's like, really, you, you can't afford to work in science programming in this country terribly well, you know. I think there's only like really half a dozen of us that do it full time um, and do no other style of science filmmaking. I would like to see um, a fund set up that was looking at supporting communicators of science, television and other. Um, but looking at television, because like, let's just take the previous film. Um, a couple of weeks ago, it went out across China. It got 12 million viewers in one night. Um, it's had 28 million so far uh, since it's been, or as far as we can tell, about 28 to 30 million since it went to air last year. Immortal will do the same. Uh, Smithsonian are running a whole week on Immortal in America, um, they're getting, they're making a thing called Women in Science um, and they're doing that into schools to try and communicate women getting into science because there's so many women in that film um, and that wasn't accidental. Uh, you know, I, I really, I was so pleased to see there was lots of women for a change in a science film. Um, I would love to see seed funding take place where I could go, look, I've got idea A, B, C, D, E, F and really I could hire five researchers people who are clever as science and good writers. And I could supervise it, because I've done this. I used to be a commissioning editor at the broad, one of the broadcasters. Um, I understand how to make films and how to raise the finance and do all that sort of stuff. But I haven't got enough hours in the day to, to start developing all the different science projects. And I'd give my ITs to do that. If I could just have a band of people working on nothing but developing science films, because, I mean, I could reel off half a dozen right now. I'm not going to because you'll pinch them. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's some really good science stories out there that would be brilliant to make films about. And um, it's all I want to do. I don't want to do history. I don't want to do social docs. I don't want to do contemporary. You know, I, I want to do films that are about trying to unravel the tricky stuff. And, and this stuff, it might look really simple now you watch it, but it's actually, it's, it's a molecular biology film, you know? It's like, that's what it actually is. Um, and the cellular stuff, I mean, it's maybe a bit infantile for some, but it's deliberately trying to go so my kids can watch it and understand it. And I test it on teenagers, I test it on all sorts of people because it's no point in, in just preaching to the 55-plus audience, you know, who watch documentaries on SBS and ABC. Because you know, let's face it, none of the channels that really do it, other than you know those two in this country, um, and it's got to appeal to a younger audience. So when I get the letters going, please could you turn down the music? I go, yeah, but it's actually catering for a slightly different feel. You know, could you not cut it so fast? Could you could you not have those jumpy cuts? Going, ah, that's the, that's the language of now, unfortunately for some, but. You know, it is. The, I test it on my grandfather, who's 97, epi, 97 year old epidemiologist. Mm. He goes, Oh, you have to quite cut it so quickly. 
You know, and it's like, there's a little bit too much background noise. Um, and that's fine. We have this dilemma every time. But, you know, and I try to get that balance between a 17-year-old and a 97-year-old. So, so, Sonia, how long is the, uh, the telomeres of the 97-year-old? Uh, unfortunately, he died two months ago. <laughs> That's all right, but I would imagine his were very good because um, he was still publishing at 96. So I think he was doing all right. Um, and, you know, alert as anything, so not a problem. What about your own? Yes, I had my telomeres tested. Um, Cal Harley, when he was testing his family, said, right, anybody on the crew want to have theirs tested? And I could hear Liz in my head going, oh, don't be silly, it's not ready yet. Um, and I'm thinking, all right, now let's have a go. And um, the cameraman said no, the sound recordist and I said yes. So we had the little finger prick test and um, a couple of months or six weeks later came the results. Mine were not good. It's a, it's a, it was a really interesting lesson in the lay person's idea of telomere biology. And I knew this. So when, I, when I agreed to have mine tested, two things made me, well made me, two things allowed me to agree. One was, I know it's malleable. I believe it's malleable. All the evidence is there that it's malleable. You can do something about it. If it was just set in stone and I could do nothing, what's the point in knowing? Because I really want to know if my telomeres were shot. Um, the second thing was I made a vow to myself that if mine were lower than I would like, I would do something about it. So um, I got my results back. And I have to say this very carefully because it's, I think it's an important point. And this... this Technology is not available freely yet. We can't go out and have our telomeres tested. It, it will be in a couple of years, but it's not there yet. The reason being partly because it's not a big enough sample group to know what the norms are. Um, but as best as they can tell at the moment, there's a bandwidth. And so um, for my age, the average was 8.5. Don't worry what, but 8.5. And the, um, the bandwidth of normal was two kilobase pairs. Um, either side, so uh, 6.5 to 10.5. I came in at 8. So I'm well and truly within normal, 6.5 to 10.5. But for my age, I, most people that were tested were 8. Sorry, 8.5. I was 8. I tracked with somebody five years older. And I went, ooh, ah, ooh. And of course, all the disclaimers, you're normal. Absolutely, the bandwidth normal. We all know if you're having your, you know... Um, blood tests, I'm um, thinking, what is the other one? Um, cholesterol tests and things. There's a great big range of normal. Uh, but I had promised myself I would do something about it, so I, uh, I did. I, I changed my diet. I started exercising more. Um, and I took three months holiday. <laughs> I did. I took three months off. For someone like me who's a workaholic, um, I did nine films in two years, and then I just stopped and I had 10 weeks, and um, the rule was no planes, so we just went camping. And so it was really amazing to actually go, I'm going to pay attention to my telomere health. Um, and it's early days, and, and Cal Harley's offered to do mine again uh, once a year for the next five years, and so we'll see. Uh, the other thing that's worth knowing is that telomerase seems to move very quickly. It fluctuates quite fast. I mean, some people even say it's hourly or daily. I mean, it depends who you talk to. But your telomerase, the enzyme, moves, fluctuates a lot. But your telomeres are much slower. Um, and the estimates are, it seems to be reflecting how you were a year ago. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but that's what the, the advice I was given. So when my telomeres were tested, we're back at a time when I had a very stressful time. So I would think my telomeres are much better now. Thank well, you Well, we, we had, we had uh, Jack McClure in the, in the program there saying that the kind of prostate cancer had disappeared as a result of, uh, well, not as a result of, but at the time that he was doing yoga and doing meditation and so on. We had the one researcher saying that stress adds 10 to 17 years in terms of ageing. What do you make of that, Roger? Um, I, I think it's, it's a little too early to really understand. There's a lot of very interesting data um, on the relationship between telomere length and all sorts of environmental factors and, and lifestyle um, things. Um, but I think it is too early. I mean, the research needs to continue. Mm. Um, I haven't had my telomeres, telomere length tested. Um, I don't see the point in it yet. Uh, because for an individual, it has too little predictive power. 
except if you have very short telomeres. Um, for people who are in the bandwidth that, um, that, that Sonia describes, um, I don't think we really know what it means to if have a length of eight. Four, if mine had been four, I would have run out and got a million tests. Well, you know, I, I think your telomeres really need to be down below the, the first centile, so um, to be really certain it means anything at this stage. Now, you know, with, with further research, um, it, it may be possible to look at telomere length and, and, and make something meaningful from it. I think it's too early for that. that that's a really important question, I think, um, be, because one of the difficulties of thinking of as to how telomere biology could af affect our lifespan is, is exactly trying to understand what would happen in cells that are not dividing and, and where their telomeres presumably are not shortening. But even for those cells, and, and I guess one of the prime examples would be brain cells. So um, we're learning more about um, cell division in the brain. Um, but classically, we think of, um, of the neurons as essentially not dividing or not, not dividing very much. However, um, they are supplied, um, they, have, they have to be supplied with nutrients and they come via the bloodstream, they come via blood vessels which are lined with cells which do divide. So even for organs like the brain, um, uh, telomere length uh, in the supply chain um, can be quite important. So, so I think even for non-dividing cells, uh, telomere biology does play a role. So I was hoping you wouldn't answer, uh, you wouldn't ask that, because <laughs> I don't know the answer. Um, potentially, yes, but but I, I, I don't know the answer. I should say that on the website that the RIOs have put on uh, here at their website, um, there's some extended interview materials, and if people want some more information about some of the things like. Um, what they can do to, uh, according to Dean Ornish and, and his work, um, there are more information, there is more information on the website if that's useful to anybody. Okay, well, Immortal airs on SBS on Sunday the 5th of December at 8.30. It is the standout documentary, I think, in the series and we've, we're very, very uh, hopeful about where it's going to go. So congratulations, Sonia. Thank you very much, Roger. And we'll see you all next week. Thank you.